Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Underrated Movie Podcast. This is a podcast where we discuss films that are underrated, underappreciated, and ones that have just slipped under the radar and passed most people by. I am your host, Derek McDuff, and joining me today is a special guest, Mike from the old Switcheroo Podcast. How's it going, Mike? It's going quite well. Looking forward to this. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited to have you on. Uh, you know, I, uh, I when, as soon as I heard your podcast, I'm a, I'm a huge Zelda fan. I listened to your episode on Zelda and Zelda 2, your, your podcast obviously being a retro gaming podcast. I don't know if you want to mention that up top before we get too deep into the weeds here. Yeah, so the old switcheroo, the idea is um, a friend and I are basically going through everything that is available on the Nintendo Switch through the Nintendo Switch online service. So that's, right now, over 250 games between the NES, the SNES, the Genesis, the N64, Game Boy, and Game Boy Advanced. Very nice. And so nice. we're working our way through all of that. Especially for me, a lot of these are games that I haven't played before because I was more of a PC gamer at the time. So something like that was my introduction to Zelda. And as we go through this, I am basically going to go through a large amount of the Zelda franchise chronologically. Very cool. I mean, as you and viewers at home won't know this, but you can see that I'm wearing a Zelda hat and I'm a very, very big fan of that, that franchise. So, you know, it's cool that, you know, you're getting introduced to it that way. But I'm a movie fan. Am I right? Yeah. So I'm also a movie fan, which I think is just something that I picked up living in the L.A. area. It's a film town. Um, so I have a letter letterboxed account at Lobaca, L-O-W-B-A-C-C-A, which largely helps me keep track of how much I've watched so that I don't rewatch things. I tend to watch a lot of older movies, old sci-fi, and at a certain point you find a lot that have cool titles but are very forgettable, and then you watch the same cool title, very forgettable movie again. So mm-hmm. that started me into doing all that. Yeah, like or like cool poster, and then the movie itself, it's like, this wasn't even in the movie, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, there's a whole lot where you get things like, oh, Astro Zombies, that's going to be awesome. It wasn't. <laughs> um, every so often, I find amazing things that way. I have a long list of movies that no one else has bothered to watch that I think are amazing. <laughs> so it's, it's worth it to find those, but... Yeah, well, you know, as as you can tell, anybody knows from listening to the show, I'm always a fan of uncovering those underrated gems. But, you know, this one, uh, much like your show, you know, you you cover old games uh, mostly on a new system on the Switch, so everything old is new again. And this, while it is a relatively uh, new movie, it's very contemporary, only from 2018, uh, is a, it's very retro feeling. It's uh, very, it's set in the 60s, uh, and it's got that kind of old school noir thriller, old school Hitchcockian kind of twisty, turny vibes. And of course, I'm talking about the film we're covering today, which is Bad Times at the El Royale, written and directed by Drew Goddard, who is absolutely one of my favorite um, writer-directors, uh, someone who I think he in, just, he in general is just super underrated. First became uh, familiar with him because he was one of the uh, writers on Lost. Um, and he's done a, a number of other movies that have kind of slipped through the cracks for whatever reason. But yeah, great ensemble cast in this one. Jeff Bridges, Cynthia Revo, John Hamm, Chris Hemsworth, Kaylee Spaney. Just a whole slew of great names. But yeah, we were we were kicking around some ideas about which one to cover. And we landed on this one. This is one of the ones you had kind of thrown out. What do you love about this movie? Or why did you want to cover it at least? I think part of what drew me to it was it was a movie that immediately jumped out to me as one that I'm always surprised when someone else mentions this as a movie they really liked from uh, 2018. And I saw it in the theater that year and never really heard anyone talk about it. And it is, in that sense, I think very underappreciated. I think it's an interesting sort of more modern approach on the genre, which I think is somewhat appropriate for Drew Goddard since he also did write and direct Cabin in the Woods, Mm -hmm. which was an amazing new look at sort of what a horror movie can be and what that genre entails. And so this isn't as much of a deconstruction as one could argue Cabin in the Woods is, but it's still very much a sort of tribute to 
noir or an extension of noir handles a lot of these characters you know having a female uh, arguably you know it's you know it's an ensemble but she is either her probably jeff bridges is probably the lead of the movie she's definitely the the character who you have the is probably the most point of view character she's the one who's just kind of the fish out of water uh because you have all these different plot lines these just all these kind of terrible people who are all intersecting for one reason or the other and it's just kind of one of those places where it's like wrong place wrong time but it's like five wrong things at the wrong time all converging and crossing over all at once and just kind of colliding in this great twisty thing and i i love these kind of movies where you'll get like a chunk here it's like here's this room and then you get this character's backstory and here's this room you get this character's backstory I, I absolutely adore all that. But uh, yeah, this one was kind of dead on arrival. It may it didn't even make its budget back. Did pretty poor. Um, nobody really talks about it. Like you said, this is one that, despite I think it having a really stellar script, got okay, pretty good reviews from critics. I think it got like a 75 on Rotten Tomatoes. But it definitely didn't set the world on fire or anything. But I remember just absolutely loving this and I also watched it in theaters, and it's always been one that I've thought about a lot, but I never really went back to, so I'm glad I had an excuse to go back and rewatch it, and sometimes when you know you go back and rewatch something that you really loved in a theater, you haven't seen it for five or six years, you're like, oh, it doesn't really hold up. But this one absolutely held up. I love the I love the, the labyrinthine just storytelling and the way people are crossing over, and the way that it just withholds information. Because this movie just kind of drops you right in. It starts with that montage of the guy. You don't know who he is. You know, you see it's Nick Offerman. He's bare, he's burying something underneath the floorboards. And then he gets killed. And then it just kind of drops you into the movie. There's just all these people meeting. And you're like, who is this person? What's their deal? What's going on here? And everyone has secrets. And slowly over the course of the film, you're just finding out more and more and more secrets about these people. And it gets more and more interesting. Yeah, and I think like, when you talk about this as being sort of a labyrinthine structure, I think what's so impressive here is that you watch a lot of old noir and mystery, a whole lot of them had sort of the same formula of throw a whole lot of stuff in, and at the very end, have someone try to explain how everything you saw was supposed to make sense. Right, like Psycho, <laughs> that's the whole thing. That's the one dig people always put on Psycho. Yeah, it's one of... Er, even that one does it with sort of a better structure that explains mm -hmm. it. But I'm thinking even closer to things like the thin man where they're like, mm. where I think it's like people in that are still can't really explain how you're supposed to know that's who did it. And that that's, you know, that's the killer kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that idea of there's a lot where just you throw, you make it confusing. And then at the end you kind of just come, come up with a see, we were clever. Cause if you followed this, <laughs> whereas this one, feels so much more orchestrated to the, going back through that. It's, everything really does fit together. There's not this idea of we're going to make it see com seem complex just because we throw so much at you, which I think even is a criticism of like another neo-noir noir under the Silver Lake. Mm -hmm. I actually haven't seen I that one yet. It is fascinating, but I have this weird problem with that because like, I feel like it threw so much at me and then just tried to hope that I picked the parts that made it seem most interesting. Whereas this one, everything is very calculated. And I think part of that's reflected in the fact that, like, the entire hotel is all a single set that they built on soundstage so that you could go room to room, you could go into the hallways and everything that they needed this hotel to be that same kind of well crafted labyrinth, really. And. They just simply built it to know exactly where they would need to be at every point that Drew Goddard just had this plan of how all this would fit together from the start. And that makes this work so well that even on the second time when you know where the reveals are going to be, it still is so satisfying because on the second time you're seeing how things were set up that you didn't that I didn't I didn't notice things the first time through that on the second time are the clear L's of what's going on. Wait a minute, why was Halle Berry scared if she was the killer the whole time? You know, stuff like that. 
And this one, there is absolutely none of that. It really, like the first time you're just drawn in, you're really curious what's going on. And this time you're like knowing what everyone's backstory is, knowing that like, okay, Jeff Bridges is in a priest. He's actually this robber, knowing that you, there's the, all this stuff is happening. And there's even this like, it's almost like an ax hanging over you a big chunk of the time because you're just, Chris Hemsworth doesn't show up until like, I don't know, like the 145 mark or something like that. And you're just waiting for this character, this foreboding presence who he's just this Charlie Mans- Manson-esque character, this cult lead, this ca- very charismatic cult leader to show up and just throw a wrench into everything. And there's so many, and he's not the only one. There's so many things like, like that. We're just like, oh my gosh, when is this going to happen? When is this going to happen? And then when it hits, you're like, it's, you're, it's so invested. And the way everything is set up, everything makes sense. And a lot of times I think the danger in that kind of, storytelling is it can be style over substance and i think maybe some people thought that about this movie but i i really don't think it is i think that this movie is one where the style completely supports the substance in it and it is this movie that is really about just the ways that we the mistakes like everyone has made these mistakes and how we deal with our, like these sins of the past both on a micro level of just individually and on a macro level as like America almost like this is very, even though it's like this small one location movie and it's a great one location movie, uh, mostly one location. There's, they go some plays, but it's mostly the Royale. It really dives into like just America's secrets and history and how like the CIA is just like spying on these people and how, how like all our politicians are these two faced people and, everyone's spying on everyone and trying to cover everything up and America's built on lies and secrecy and deceit and the Vietnam war, which comes in at the end. And, you know, that's one thing I love too, is there's this, the character, the concierge, um, miles is his name. I want to say, yeah, how he, you see all these things that he's done and he's just been spying on these people and he feels terrible about it, but he's like, this isn't even the worst of it. He's just like, I've done so. And you're like, what could be worse than this? And then when he gives that, speech at the end and, and he talks about all the people he's killed and he says i've killed 123 people and you think for a second like he's a psychopath murder or something but then he just cuts to the vietnam war and he has all this trauma from having to go into this war and this skill quote unquote that he has of being like a sharpshooter that he clearly had just like you just it's such you just get a little bit of info that's all you need just like him shooting birds and his dad is yelling at him and then that cuts to him being a sharpshooter in vietnam and then he has to do it again even though he really doesn't want to it's it's so good it's just so the themes in this movie are so powerful about when are you allowed to be redeemed when do you forgive yourself when do you let others forgive you who are the ones you choose to let forgive you because there's that whole thing about jeff bridges is he a priest he only wants to tell him the sins if he's a priest he kind of they both kind of realize at the end he's not but he still is okay with getting that absolution from him. Yeah, I, I thought, I think it, there's some religious stuff in here that I think is fascinating, as with a lot of Drew Goddard stuff. So, uh, so yeah. there's a lot in this movie. Yeah, and I think to talk about two elements with Miles, so the first part is, I find it interesting because I feel like they play that character in such a way that the first time through, he really did give me a Norman Bates vibe, that he mm. they do set him up, that you think you have this moment that he is this you know, serial killer or something. Because, you know, you have him sort of secluded off in a room behind the taxidermy that feels very much that sort of psycho vibe. And he has this focus on right or wrong while also feeling that he's doing things that are very wrong. Where in Psycho, it plays out one way. And here, it turns out it's this conflict that he's been forced into because of war. And it's not really what you expect. But then it leads to his death scene, which I think is fascinating and kind of gets to one of the interesting stylistic choices, but I think it's used really well, which is because the El Royale is split between California and Nevada, and based on a real lodge that did that, Mm -hmm. which really was owned by the mob at one, by in part by the mob, is that when you get to his death scene, he's right on the state line and they've, and he has um, Dar- Darlene on one side, and you have Father Flynn, Jeff Bridges' character, on the other, with Darlene at- saying that he needs that Jeff Bridges' character needs to help him from the Nevada side, which is supposed to be the is described as the hope and optimism side, 
And ultimately, he gets that final comfort as he's dying from Jeff Bridges on the California side, which is the warm and comfortable side of the lodge. And it's this kind of placement that, with how much Drew Goddard was doing stuff on purpose, there's a bit in Blu-ray extras where it does say that every decision had meaning. And so when I look at something like that, I think he's putting in a lot of that this isn't necessarily a salvation moment, but it's a comfort moment. And that's, which is still meaningful, but it's very much, it's a comfort for someone as they're dying. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, like you said, this is not a movie where it seems like there are any accidents, you know, a, a, some filmmakers are are just going to be like, I'm going to shoot it this way because it looks cool. I'm going to use this set or this, this, filter or whatever, whatever, because it, it looks good or whatever. And this movie looks phenomenal. Obviously, it looks so cool. It looks so great. It's so stylized and sleek and interesting. But it's all in the service of telling the story that it wants to do a uh, tell. And much like a David Fincher, I think that Drew Goddard is someone who is very, very intentional with every single decision that he makes and you know you brought up that scene where he he dro- dies on the state line and there's so much in this movie about duality that i think is really fascinating and choice you know obviously that's kind of chris hemsworth's whole deal he gives that big speech about oh b- between good and evil and what are you going to be and, and everyone's making you choose and that really lines up with miles character about how he was forced to do this thing that he sees as an ultimate evil be in this war and take human beings lives. Um, All these characters who essentially they're all people who are likable for the most part, but they are people who have done, they are people who we would view as except for Cynthia Revo, evil people. They are criminals. They are murderers. They are DIA people who are spying on people, but they still do heroic things. They still make sacrifices. They still learn and grow some more than others. And I think that's all really cool. And, you know, there's obviously there's the roulette wheel, the duality with that. They're obviously, the split down the line and they just keep going back and forth between the two things. You could almost look at it as like like a purgatory between heaven and hell. There's a lot of, I think, symbolism with that, with like the lighting and stuff and then just the end with the fire. And, I, I, you know, maybe that's intentional. Maybe it's not. There's a lot you could read into this film with the all the symbolism that's being put into it, especially in that kind of... 60s like you said mob run casino like there's the illusions that there's like nixon on the tv there's illusions that that's probably kennedy on the tape but then i love that they they make the decision that like it doesn't really matter like who's on it because we are making the choice to like kind of throw this into the fire and move on with our lives and not dwell on the sins of the past like they say he's dead and we could probably get a lot more money from that We've we've got this money in this bag. Let's go and live our lives. And that's after all the bloodshed and fire and destruction. I think that if this movie earns its, I guess you would say, bittersweet ending. Because it's not a happy ending. But these characters, probably the two characters you want to see get out of it the most, do get some redemption in the end and, and get to have a, a, a real life there and get to go and look, he gets to go see her in Reno. I, I love that ending scene. Yeah. And it's, it's certainly, at least it ends with Darlene singing, which I at least, I don't think I'd call her a main, or I wouldn't say that there's a main character to this, mm-hmm. but certainly she's the only one that really provides a soundtrack for part of this. So it's both an interesting character and it's just an incredible performance. The first time I saw this, I did not realize at all that she's British. I think she's really convincing in playing American. Mm -hmm. And then I would have never expected, and apparently this is how they did this, all the time she's singing, she is actually singing. They're not doing anything pre-recorded. Really? Okay. Yeah, and that's particularly impressive for a couple of those very long scenes that had to each, yeah. each had about two dozen takes. So one of these scenes is of her singing, and it starts from being when it's from inside one of the secret hallways. Right. And that scene is and, so haunting with it echoing and everything. 
And that whole thing she had to do every time because it is, it's not just that it's from through a, through a secret mirror, basically, but also it's a very long, uncut shot because they they wanted you to feel like you're that this is all actually happening because there's not those cuts. And it's this incredibly long scene utilizing that hallway and it it looks be- beautiful. The song is amazing. And the whole thing comes together just so well crafted. Yeah, absolutely. And I I had that in my notes too about that that long cut because that is one of I think the best long like oneers I've seen in quite some time. It is it is impressive, and it, it just gives you so much information visually. The song in it, obviously, is very haunting and unsettling. In, it, you know, it's a beautiful song, but then when you cut to it from that angle and it's just in that creepy hallway, it's, it's very spooky. And you're having that character walk through and see... And this is when you really don't know much about what's going on at all. You see the floorboards thing, and you're like, okay, cool. This harkens back to the beginning scene, but something's wrong here. She's seeing, so it introduces you to her, and that's when you first get introduced to Kaylee Spain, and you're like, oh, so Dakota Johnson has just kidnapped her. You don't know their sisters. You don't know that relationship at all. You're learning all these things as he is. You don't even really know who he is. You know that he's someone who isn't who he says he is. He's not the vacuum salesman because he was looking for the bugs and stuff like that. But it's just this great way to just kind of like, set you into this world and be like here's some tidbits it's just giving you introducing you all these mysteries that will pay off so well by the end of this and i think that's something goddard has always done well people go back and forth on how well they paid off the mysteries on lost but i think he i think they did a really good job of paying off a lot of that stuff and he was one of the writers who i know was very very important with setting up a lot of those things and then paying off a lot of those things. He wasn't on the whole run of the show, but he he did a really good job of that. And this is kind of like that on a micro scale. You're just seeing like, here's the beginning of the movie. Here's all these people. And all of these things slowly, but surely will be paid off. And you mentioned the music too. It's I, I read that this, all of the songs that he chose in this, he went to distributors and was like, before we start shooting this movie, make sure that you get the rights to this. Otherwise, cause I don't, want to use replacement songs these are all deliberate choices so everything was thought out yeah no i I think it was not just that the music was deliberate choices but i think also that the music was in some case cases largely chosen first Mm -hmm. to create this sense of an era and then the story built in around it and it really does do an amazing job of capturing i think both it captures the era and i think to some extent it captures the change going on in the era. Um, yeah, I think much yeah. as this is representing a boundary, you do have John Hamm's character is very much a character that doesn't represent late 60s zeitgeist. He's more establishment government agent kind of thing that has it fe- he feels like he would have been more at home in the 50s. Yeah, yeah. He does feel like a very like you know, like even the thing of like I'm a traveling vacuum salesman, which is a ruse, feels very fifties. But yeah, he does feel like, and how he's like, well, I've got to protect these ladies over, here. you know, like that kind of thing. He's he's very much of kind of that old era. His first interaction that he has with the Dakota Johnson character, he kind of refers to her as a hippie. He seems like someone who's like not quite, you know, in line. He's just kind of like very old school. Uh, doesn't understand this revolution, which the revolution ends up very quickly kind of killing him. And then, you know, we saw there's, there's definitely good things that came about in the sixties and the revolution, but then there's also like, uh, and the countercultural, but then there was also like the, the crazy cults and stuff like that. And the kind of like people who were like, burn it all down and just uh, in not a good way, in a way that was like these, these ridiculous cults that came that like, we're going to kill the old religion and replace it with ourselves. And that's what you see in the Hemsworth killer character, uh, uh, I want to say Billy Ray. Billy, it's uh, was it Billy? Um, Billy Lee. Billy Lee. Thank you. Um, yeah, and yeah. I think that's that's probably the one of the other parts that appeals to me so much. In part, when I saw this in the theater, I had no idea that a character like that was in this. And so, in the same way that so much of this kind of dribbles out to the audience, I think I picked up on a lot of what was going to happen faster. 
than I think most people did because the Manson family, I'm not going to say is an un- obsession of mine, but I'm definitely more familiar with that than most. And when they started to have flashbacks for Rose's character, everything immediately made me think that this was a Manson family kind of thing. And that's not just her immediate flashbacks, but even just the mentions of a killing in the late 60s. Because there's like news broadcasts that you're hearing about a couple that's been killed. And really quickly, that was a, this is giving me that kind of a vibe. And then when they introduced Billy Lee, and it's, and again, in things aren't being done incidentally, the way that they shoot him, I think I'm not reaching. The first time you see him, it's him walking along a beach where you can't really see, you know, you don't see his face or anything, but you just see that it's a person walking along a beach and the footsteps behind behind him, which immediately makes me think of, there's a religion poster where it is the two foot, you know, two mm-hmm. feet, two sets of footprints in the sand and then one set of footprints for a little bit. And sort of the focus of someone walking along the beach with footprints immediately makes me think that because then the next shot of him he's backlit by the sun so you have sort of this halo effect and they continue to shoot him that way so you have that initial flashback where he has, where the sun is sort of functioning as a halo you can't even see his face you have later when he's ex- trying to explain to all his followers how things work and they keep angling the shot so that there's or like a stone wall behind him with a with a round circle that again lines up with his head, and I think there's even one of the points in there where he puts his arms outstretched to either side as well, and then I think even in the El Royale at the end is that large clock, I think in the same way to again put that halo effect because he is putting himself in this position as as a god to his followers and so they continuously shoot him that way and i think it's fascinating yeah absolutely because yeah like he i really got that same vibe from that first scene when you know it's like the two footprints in the sand like other thing you know that's kind of almost like a cliche at this point and then you see that backlit and he's got the long hair and he's got like the white kind of like almost draping clothes and it's just almost looks like a like a very messiah-esque thing that he's doing and he kind of puts himself out there as this like christ-like figure this like savior and he talks about like what is god is god dead like he has this whole thing and he's definitely at in the same the same or a much different way but in he's doing the same thing as jeff bridges where he is kind of purporting to be this religious figure he jeff bridges is pretending to be a priest he's pretending to be like this messiah figure and you have them kind of mirrored in that way and it's touching on the all these interesting religious themes and about you know like you said is it about salvation or is it about comfort and it's it, that I think is so fascinating. And I think the fact- there's also an interesting mm-hmm. duality there in a sense. As you brought brought duality, and that they're both doing that, but Billy Lee's doing it, sort of, at least in part, clearly to gain attention, sort of gain followers. He has this unhealthy, predatory way of treating the women that are around him, mm-hmm. and then on the flip side. Jeff Bridges' character, Father Floyd, we'll stick with that name for it, because I like Jeff Bridges playing, an, uh, or sorry, Father Flynn. I like Jeff Bridges playing another character named Flynn. I was going to say, yeah, is that a reference to Tron <laughs> when I first watched it? Well, but um, he specifically says that the reason he's dressed as a priest is because it kind of keeps people away from him. So he's using that as a way to be less noticed while Billy Lee's using it as a way to be more noticed. Yeah, absolutely. They're both kind of draping themselves in this iconography for completely opposite reasons. And in the end, Bridges, who is a pretty selfish character, I would say, uh, at least at the start, he kind of is able to, by the end, he, he has that, he in giving some peace and resolution uh, to Miles, I think he himself is kind of absolving himself intentionally not of his past sins. And I think that, yeah, that all ties into the arc that he's been going on and all these 
themes, which obviously a theme of redemption is something that is inherently very religious. And it is, I think that all the stuff about the American dream and all that is also tied into here. Uh, and about how like the American dream is kind of this, this is kind of this nonsense that we invented to just like pull yourself up by your bootstraps and whatever. And the way that this subverts that and comments on it, I think is absolutely fascinating. Yeah, I think and one other thing that I'm just going to mention because it ties in a lot with the Billy Lee stuff mm-hmm. and some stuff I mentioned earlier is the way that style was used to serve the substance. I think basically was one of the interesting things I think they did with color is sort of forewarning that Billy Lee shows up in a sense. Mm -hmm. Um, I think not in a sense that anyone reasonable would guess, but when you go back and you're like, this all does feel like this was sort of to highlight things, which is the color red. Yeah. It's used in limited situations, generally as very much as a, Bad color that's sort of tied to something, something evil or something sinister, which is not exact, which is not inventive here. But they really limit it then to the border is red. There's only two other red objects really in the hotel that are both on the border. Mm-hmm. But then it's effectively the outlaws, the real outlaws in this that walk along the border, that actually walk the border line. When you look at some, someone like Darlene, they step over it, but they don't walk that painted line the way Billy Lee does. But then also, it's the character Rose who mm-hmm. calls Billy Lee. So you have the character whose name is a shade of red <laughs> calling Billy Lee on the red phone. And it's this thing where it's just all of those things on my second viewer and knowing that the colors were intentional through so much of this was this re rewatching and being like, this is all indicating this is where the problems are going to be coming from. It's not at all clear. Wouldn't have, wouldn't have been at all clear. My first viewing to give that stuff significance. And honestly, I don't think I would pay as much attention to it. If not for hearing the people that made the movie talk about how they did this stuff on purpose. Yeah. On, yeah. And, they did so much of this. Yeah. And I think honestly, that's something I wanted to have thought about before, but I did notice a lot of red in this, especially around Billy Lee. And it's that kind of, yeah, it drapes him in this demonic evil antichrist kind of vibe, but they use the red very sparingly. It's very, and it pops a bit. And I think red is probably one of the most powerful colors that you can use in a movie. It just pops so much, especially when something I think is shot on film. Like this was shot on Kodak. It wasn't shot digitally. So I think it really makes that red show up that much more, especially when it's used in that that sparing color. Like, you know, you think of something like The Wizard of Oz. They, you know, there's a reason that they changed it from the silver slippers in the book to ruby slippers because red just pops so much on screen. Keeping in line with the red shoes... I actually just recently saw the movie The Red Shoes, which is now quickly become one of my favorite movies of all time. The way they use red in that movie is very similar, I think, to the way they use red in this movie, where it's used very sparingly, it's very intentionally, and it really just draws your eye. And it's kind of about this this seduction, this temptation, but also at times this kind of just darkness and evil that could just draw you in. It's so seductive and powerful and alluring, but so dangerous and ultimately very destructive and i think that we could probably write a whole you know a whole paper on the color theory in this movie and how prominent and important specifically the red is yeah and actually they they created green as special as well so you have you have a lot of blues and purples in the sort of the cooler half of the lodge but they really don't use green which they treated as representing opportunity and hope until you get to Darlene's number at the end. When she's in Reno, they're out of the hotel. She's wearing this green sequin dress. But I did find it interesting that the two spots that I noticed green before then, and again, it's, it's the, I don't think it's coincidence because 
they're so clear that they did so much on purpose is the like the quilts that Darlene put puts up so that she can sing without it hopefully bothering people are green quilts that she puts up on her walls. And then the only other time there's a shot that has a lot of green in it is that there's the scene where she's singing while Jeff Bridges' character is digging. And you're watching in the hallway character Emily with a gun effectively trying to decide whether or not she needs to kill the other people that are still here. And so she's listening to Darlene sing, and there's two shots very close in succession, which are her finally starting to tap one of her fingers to the beat. And then there's a close-up of her eye with her, which is, I think, to, which is a noticeably green eye. Sort of at the point where she's re where you can tell she's no longer try trying to decide if she needs to kill him or not, he's figured he doesn't have to, and walks away. And I'm not saying anyone was cast because they have green eyes, but that did feel like a shot that was included in a very deliberate way, based off of how they were trying to use color, and sort of the opportunity that that would have provided them. Yeah, honestly, yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. There, I, that's another thing I didn't pick up. Just like, a, I, I definitely noticed the red a lot more watching it. But yeah, the, now that you point that out, I'm like, there was a lot of green in this that, once again, I think pulls through, like, you know, the cinematic history. Gone with the Wind, obviously, Scarlett O'Hara's green eyes were a huge, huge thing that they, they wanted to really emphasize because that was, I guess, such a big thing in the novel, and it was very important in this. So yeah, green, obviously green and red, natural opposites to the point where they are on our stop signs, or our traffic lights, I should say. And like that's a kind of universally recognized thing of being polar opposites. And like I said, Jeb just goes once again, green and red. It's a dichotomy, just like everything else in this movie. Yeah, and I think it's... Well, what makes that a really fascinating thing to think about, for me to think about when I take a step back, is how heavily he's infused this with color and with meaning to that color when really this is noir which is so quintessentially a black and white genre that it's amazing how this never feels like it isn't noir to me and yet it is so colorful yeah yeah it's it's that and that's why i think this is it's a classic genre it's a classic feeling film but updated with the lifeblood of modern films, modern technology, in a way that they could not have done in the past. And even something as simple as color can really take an old genre and refract it in a completely new way. The other thing, too, that I wanted to say, so we've talked a lot about color. We also mentioned music. I really want to shout out the score of this by Michael Guccino, who is probably, if he's, if he's not my favorite, he's at least in my top two or three film composers of all time, because I think that that also really vibes with the noir of this, because I feel like he, his scores a lot of times, if you listen to like his Pixar scores or like his Star Trek scores or something like that, they're big and bombastic. Whereas here it's very like low. It's very in the background. It's foreboding. It's almost like just kind of like background music to just set the score. You never even really notice it. And it's doing so much good work. Yeah, I was going to say, on the second rewatch, I'd noticed um, this rewatch. It's like, I didn't even notice that he did that. And I didn't really have music that stuck out, stuck out to me. But at the same time, when there isn't the music of the era playing, you know, it's not that it's necessarily quiet. It, so it does a very good job of blending in there without calling attention to itself, I think. Yeah, definitely. It kind of just, it fits perfectly with the exact tone of the movie, which is what I think, you know, a good score should do. A good score shouldn't throw you out of the movie. Be like, okay, well, here's here's a dramatic moment, and it feels, it only feels dramatic because of the score. The score should help you. It's just another t thing in the toolmaker's kit. It's not a, shouldn't rely on it, and they don't in this. It's just, it makes everything work so well. Yeah, I think, and I think the other thing, only because so much of what I've said has been about very much filmmaking decisions of mm -hmm. the 
direction, the cinematography, the set design, is all of that is still just providing the, the environment for what are, I think, across the board, really good performances. I don't really yeah. think there's anything, anyone that has a weak performance, and I think so many of them have to really be able to play dual roles in some capacity. So I think one of the interesting things is on Ham's character, who is a person having to pretend to be another person in this. And on the rewatch, it's really interesting to see how that's being done, both with his performance and how he's playing this with accent and with attitude. And then on the other side with how it's been written for him to play that. And it makes for this very interesting character that clearly has two elements to him, and they both seem fairly believable. If he had been that first character the whole time, I wouldn't have been at all surprised. If he had been sort of, I guess, what is his real character in there the whole time, I wouldn't be surprised. And I'm not surprised that the character John Hamm is playing is playing that other character the way that he is for what he needs to do. And so it's this interesting thing where that is a lot harder to be playing one person that is convincingly playing a second person as opposed to just having different roles that don't have to be linked. Yeah. I mean, Robert Downey Jr. won an Academy Award for doing that, you know, for being a dude playing to do disguises as another dude, you know? Uh, so <laughs> I think I think that's a very good point. And it once again flows right into this uh, message of dichotomies and just dualities. and. Yeah, I think that it's one of these many disparate, seemingly disparate plots that all kind of converge and cross over and stuff like that. Are you generally a fan of movies that do this, where there's all these different characters and they're all kind of on their own stories that don't necessarily have to do with each other at the start, but all kind of cross over? Do you like that kind of storytelling? I think if it's done well, I do. Mm -hmm. And certainly something like this that really is able to sort of handle the handoffs and the crossovers. It works so well. It's a dangerous thing to do because you can easily do it in a way that just comes off as messy or unstructured. And so I think that's what's so impressive is that this does it well. Right. And I've, I've heard it referred to before as like hyperlink cinema, um, which I think is like interesting, you know, when you when you have all these kind of different cross cutting things, you know, like, you know, people always talk about like 21 grams or like happy endings and Things like traffic, I'm, a, I'm a, or Steven Soderbergh, stuff like that. City of God, I guess, is another one. Yeah, no, and it's, I mean, I'd even, honestly, I feel like it fits in that same theme, is like even this, The Simpsons did it for one episode, like 30 stories in 30 minutes. And when you can get the flow between stories and you can interconnect things, it, it's sort of that, that feeling of getting, you know, completing a puzzle and all the pieces fit. Right. And like you say, it, 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 when it doesn't work, it, it's very frustrating and it, it doesn't work at all. Like I remember there was some movie I saw with like Matthew Fox where there was like, I think it was called Vantage Point and it just like really did not work. And it was a frustrating, pretty boring movie. But when it does work and you're like, oh my gosh, it's like all you see everything connected in your mind. You see all the pieces coming together. You're like, wow, they really did it. It's 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 difficult, I think, very difficult to pull off. But when you do pull it off, like here, it's so rewarding. And you get those moments where it's that's what was going on, because now I'm seeing it from a different angle. And now I understand why that person reacted the way that they did. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But yeah, uh, as, as we're kind of, I guess, wrapping up here, are there do you have any other thoughts about this movie and and its themes and, and anything else you want to say about it? I think the one other thing that I do find interesting about this, I'm not entirely surprised that it's not the only one that tried to do a Char Charles Manson, Manson family kind of movie mm -hmm. around this time. But I do find it interesting that for this being one that didn't do so explicitly, it's clearly drawing from the Manson family, but it's, it's also clearly a distinct separate character. Yeah. Is, I think this is a much more interesting portrayal, even though it's only part of the movie, of what the Manson family was, than there were two other movies 
prominently at least, that came out within about a year of this, both with the Manson family yeah. in it. Because this is 2018, and 2019, Quentin Tarantino had Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which heavily relies on the Manson family. And then The Haunting of Sharon Tate with Hilary Duff came out that year as well. And so all of this is marking 50 years since those killings. But I find it kind of interesting that the movie that I think portrayed it the most interestingly is also the movie that didn't mention it was doing a Manson family <laughs> thing. Didn't call it that, didn't really advertise it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's why I think this, I do think that that helps the movie a lot because it's not I think the best allegories are ones that are just they're not one for one. They're like you can like like, yeah, this is clearly supposed to be the Manson family, but you can also draw so much into it. It's not just telling that story. It's telling a much more universal thing. And while I like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, it the ending just kind of feels like a little like not completely out of left field because he does go to the ranch or whatever for a bit. But it, do, it feels a little disconnected from the rest of the story in a way that it doesn't here. Here it feels like this is just a bomb that's been ticking and ticking and waiting to go off the whole time. And all of these characters have been, whether they know it or not, drawn here to this big finale. And, and Chris Hemsworth, I think, is so, so good in this role. I think that helps it a lot. I think, he, honestly, one of our few real young movie stars that we have there's that list that came out i can't remember a couple months ago or whatever and it was like he was like the only guy on there that was like under 45 or something that was in the top 20 movie stars recognizable movie stars everyone else is like a tom cruise or something where they're all from another generation because we just don't have um you know so we're so franchise driven as opposed to star driven these days and you need to have a role like that someone who is playing this charismatic character that you really believe that he would just get all these women and people and followers to just fall in love with him because he's Chris fucking Hemsworth, you know? So I think that's, that's so important. Yeah. No, he play, he plays that great as well. So then uh, we talked about this being hyperlink cinema and, you know, the, the, with these different threads, uh, I want to ask you, do you have any other films that you would think would fall into this category that are a favorite of yours? Oh, that's, Difficult. I'm not sure I can think of anything offhand that really has quite that sense to it. The first it is one that mind, I yeah, yeah. I think the first ones that come to mind are a little bit closer to different perspectives on things, which isn't which isn't the same thing. Well hit me with it, hit me with it. Let me hear. It feels cliche, but like the first one that kinda of comes to mind of how you're seeing this from different perspectives. Actually, there's two that put this. One would be Rochamont, which is the, the very mm. classic, here's the same story from multiple perspectives, and you can see how the same events are being reflected differently. But it's a bit more about how it's perceived than just seeing how pieces fit together. Actually, the other movie that comes to mind, it isn't quite this, because it's not how different characters fit together. It's how the same characters fit together. The same characters fit together with time travel is a movie called FAQs about time travel. That's probably about 20 years old. I think okay. that is a kind of movie that it jumps around a lot. It's a comedy, but they also thought so much about the time travel elements that you have a lot of things that don't make sense until later because they're effectively crossing paths with themselves as they're going around through time. That's fascinating. I, I'm a big fan of time travel movies, so I'll, I'll have to check that one out. For my part, I was thinking about this too a little bit because I, a movie that I covered, it's not exactly the same because the characters don't directly cross over, but they kind of do in like a past lives esque situation, and that's Cloud Atlas. Uh, I think that movie is an unsung masterpiece, uh, which is why I covered it, because I, I just love that movie. I think the Wachowskis are geniuses. When it comes to that, I think that Steven Soderbergh uh, is someone who who does this every once in a while. I think, you know, I haven't watched it since the pandemic, but Contagion is a, a movie that kind of does this with all these different characters and experiencing uh, this kind of world changing thing and how they all deal with it and, and cross over and stuff like that. So I think there's there's some good ones out there. Oh, uh, 
Yeah. What do you I, got? I'm looking up a list now. One of the ones that does jump off about mm-hmm. at me right off the bat is um, Locke's talking to smoking barrels. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. There you go. That one is amazingly well done as well for having it all fit together. That it's not just a lot of characters crossing paths, but it really has a way of imparting meaning into interactions that you didn't think had meaning. That's a good one. And you know, another one too, that I was just thinking of is uh, Dunkirk, you know, which has these three different storylines and the timing in that one is really weird, but they kind of all cross over there at the end. And, you know, it's obviously based on a real historical event, but seeing how all these people play, came together and no, no one's always playing with time and, and character interactions in really interesting and, and complex ways. And I think that's one that does it really well too. Yeah. And I think, I guess it's worth mentioning, but I really need to re rewatch it because it's been years is I think Pulp Fiction is probably mm, the yeah. movie that kind of feels like it puts that on the, on the map in a sense for a distinct intentional style. Yeah, yeah, and, definitely. And I mean, doing a bit of jumping with time as well. That's definitely also one that kept, that like I said, I need to rewatch it. It's been far too long since I have. Yeah, Tarantino is someone who I think is really fascinated with ensembles and character stories and interactions. And I would say even you know, Pulp Fiction did that really well. But I think Reservoir Dogs, because uh, you, you do get all these. They are kind of all in a crew, but you do get the bits and pieces of their lives and how they all came together. So I think that one does it well as well. But this one maybe is one of the best when it comes to doing this kind of stuff. And it just shows how difficult it is really. But yeah. Yeah. I think that's from how precise that was from the start. I th- one of the interesting things just about how prepared Drew Goddard was, was one of the bits that I'd heard was someone's basically like, we put a giant clock on a set and that is a horrible thing to do for continuity but Drew Goddard was like, I know what minute everything's happening at. Now so that, like, that's impressive. Yeah, the, he, he, everything was so well structured that it's like, yeah, we can put a clock because I know what time that should read. We're not doing shots and then we'll piece this together later. Yeah, and, and so yeah, I, I think yeah, this movie is really successful, works really well. But yeah, this is underrated. So why do you, why do you think this movie didn't really hit at the time? I'm not fully sure. It caught my attention, and so, Mm -hmm. you know, I saw it because it did catch my attention. I do kind of wonder if some element of that is that I was a bit more... It's an era that I'm a bit more drawn to. That because it is a period film, ultimately, I do kind of wonder if that put some people off without having something else sort of to sell them on it. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think also, you know, coming out in 2018, it really comes out, and I mentioned it before, in the era of franchise films. So so many of the movies, they, all, right up to like 2019, they have to be like these, you have to be part of a cinematic universe or on a, even if it's something original, based on an existing IP or something like that. And, you know, even today, like, it's it's kind of amazing to me that we're, we're maybe starting to see that trend reverse a little bit this year, you know, when we had, I mean, Barbie and Mario were obviously huge hits and they were based on pre-existing IP, but Oppenheimer is just a m- movie that Nolan made about a dude. So hopefully we get to see more like of these movies that are done by these people like Drew Goddard, who have a really great vision for an original story. I'm still not sure that if I'm convinced that's going to happen because you also had movies that failed this year, like the creator, which felt like, a very clear vision from someone trying to tell a new and original story and the audience just frankly wasn't there for it. So I do hope though that these movies, these mid budget films with a real vision at the center of it with a real creative flair that are not just here's an adaptation of a book or here's a video game or here's this superhero or whatever. Cause those, I, and I'm not trying to say I don't like those movies. I like those movies. I just want other movies to succeed as well. Yeah, I think on this one, I kind of, it kind of makes me wonder also if there was something about how it could have been marketed. Um, so like, certainly, I appreciate that the entire Chris Hemsworth thing was a surprise to me in how he shows up in this. I don't know if that's the kind of thing where a slightly different amount of teasing on this could have shifted people on that. 
I'm not sure. Yeah, like maybe. I say there's so many movies that you know, I think movies that probably line up with things that you have or will cover that how they're marketed is a much bigger deal than what the movie was or wasn't. Yeah, I honestly kind of agree because I think of something from last year that was a bigger success. It was a moderate success. It was a mid-budget movie with a lot of characters. I guess that you could count this one as another hyperlink movie uh, where it's all these different characters and they end up in a one location thing, a bullet train, which I think is not as good a movie as this one, but that one was very successful. And I think that the marketing definitely played a significant factor in that. Yeah, there's de- there's definitely that I'm always a bit more surprised. I'm always surprised when people mention this, not because I'm surprised people thought it was good. I'm surprised people saw it. Yeah, but I feel like that's the dis- distinction there is it's when I see people go- mention, oh, what was, you know, what was your the best movie you saw in 2018? And I have some people say Bad Times the El Royale. My thought always is, I can't believe you saw it. <laughs> not I can't believe you thought that was the best movie that year. So to me, it really feels like it's getting people to give it a chance. Yeah, which is, you know, kind of the the whole point of uh, this show is is hopefully trying to get people to give a chance to these movies that are really great that, you know, for whatever reason, just did not hit upon release. And I love it when movies get reappraised. Maybe one day this will be, you know, something like Peeping Tom or or one of those movies that was kind of this lost classic that now people are reevaluating. I could see this becoming a cult classic. So who knows? Um, that's what that's what I hope for kind of every time I do an episode of this show is that is that maybe some people out there will find it that I didn't know of it before. I definitely have a list of movies that are on the I need I would like to start the cults to make these cult classics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, just real, just give us a, a couple real quick. Um, I'm gonna say top one I'll go with because it's it's one of my top four in Letterboxd, and I am genuine about this is Voyage of the Rock Aliens from 1984 is a ridiculous and amazing uh, musical. Okay, nice. I'll, I'll have to have you back on at some point and cover that one, because that, that sounds interesting. I would love to come back and, exp- and introduce more people to that, because currently I'm only doing that in groups that can fit in my living room. <laughs> um, and I'm running out of... <laughs> I'm running out of people. Well, very nice. I, I hopefully I think I have a few more listeners than will fit in one living room. So hopefully, hopefully some people will check. I'm including myself. I'm gonna have to check that one out myself now too. But yeah, uh, that sounds awesome. And yeah, thank you. Just like this movie was awesome. Thank you, thank you once again for coming on. I know you you mentioned it briefly at the start, but if, where can people find more of you and your your uh, podcast and and your film stuff? Yeah. So f- for. My thoughts on movies that vary between this in depth and a lot briefer. I am on Letterboxd at Lobaca, L O W B A C C A. And then for all the video game stuff, the old Switch, uh, Switch Aru, that's Switch A R O O dot com, or wherever you get your podcasts. But you can go from our website to get to wherever you want to get it from as podcast or to our YouTube or to our other social media. That's our one-stop shop to get to all of that. Very cool. Very cool. And then, yeah, I'll say also anybody out there who are you listening, if you're, if this is the first time you're listening, if you're, you know, a, a fan of the old switch route and you came over here, I would love for you guys to stick around, listen to some more episodes, uh, follow us everywhere at the, uh, at underrated movie podcast, uh, on all those socials on Spotify and Apple YouTube as well. Now, just got a new logo, new rebrand, and then also got the rebrand for the recently re- recently relaunched Patreon. Uh, so if you want to go to patreon.com slash underrated movie podcast, it's called Underrated Disc 2, where we do a couple bonus podcasts, including Infinity Stones and Dragon Bones, my podcast on the MCU, uh, is available to all patrons, and then $3 patrons also get another bonus podcast, we're talking about sports films called Underdogs. Uh, and then if you're at the $5 level, you can actually choose a film for me to talk about here on Underrated. So a lot of good perks there, a lot of good stuff. But if you wanted to support us for free, just tell a friend or give us five stars on whatever app you're listening on. It helps us a lot so much. But once again, thank you so much for coming on and, and letting me talk about this movie, which I adore. 
I mean, thank you for giving me a reason to go back to this. I haven't seen it since I saw it in theater, and it was so satisfying to rewatch. Yep, yep, I, I had a great time with it, and hopefully you guys did all out there too, but we'll see you all next time.